War rages in Ukraine. The verbs now start to change. War grinds on, some say, as hope of a short-lived conflict fades. How do we get here? What explains the war? What conclusion should we draw from it? To discuss these questions and more, welcome to a very special edition of Salvage Live, the event series brought to you by Haymarket Books and Salvage, a journal of revolutionary arts and letters appearing twice a year in Britain and shipped to subscribers around the world. I'm Barnaby Rain. I'll be hosting tonight without the usual assistance of the wonderful Aniola Loku Tariba. And first, let me share the story of this event. It's been a while in the making. We at Salvage have just published our editorial for the new issue. Subscribe now to get it on your doorstep. And it's a long essay about this war and its lessons for our new global politics. As the war started two months ago now, I wanted to interview Ilya Matviev, a left-wing Russian dissident. But with censorship ramping up inside Russia, speaking freely became impossible for him. Now he is able to join us, and he's accompanied by a brilliant Ukrainian scholar, Vladimir Shenko. Against all those militarists in both blocs who tell us to line up behind their aggressive nationalism, or they label us supporters of the other camp, this event is held by and for a left against all imperialisms. Our salvage essay is concerned above all with highlighting a parallel between this moment and the early 1970s, the last time world capitalism shifted from one regime of accumulation to another amid the interlocking crises of the economy, natural resource provision, geopolitical control, and concomitant cultural schisms. All these contradictions were structured then as now by capital, but all together formed a distinctive global conjuncture, that category we take from Althusser, for the transition to neoliberalism. And, and we argued that this crisis may mark the transition to something different, better or worse. But today, so have a look at our essay for all that. Today, though, we'll be focusing on the politics of Russia and Ukraine. One easy but misguided trap now is to imagine that Western states really care about Ukrainians since they are quote unquote white. Witness all the telling slips from reporters horrified that blonde haired, blue eyed children now fear bombs just as darker children all over the world long have. Poland, which just months ago erected barbed wire fences and sent troops to its borders to deflect tens of thousands of people so that Syrian and Afghan mothers died of hypothermia after burying their babies. That same Polish government now integrates a wave of over 2 million Ukrainian refugees and says that it welcomes them with open arms. Eurostar, whose trains speed under the dinghies of drowning refugees in the English Channel, now offers free and safe travel to refugees from war, as long as they're Ukrainian. But who those refugees are is really less important than who their attackers are. Recently in Britain, Eastern European migrants were a major focus of racist panic. You wouldn't want Romanians moving next door, said Nigel Farage. Now, though, Ukrainians are white because their suffering can figure in a story of civilization attacked by barbarians, which was the single word headline The Guardian chose to depict the awful massacre at Bucha. Come to Ukraine, says its president, Vladimir Zelensky, appealing for international volunteers to join his army to defend Europe and our common civilizational values. As the threat to civilization shifts from the Muslim world to Russia and China, Ukraine is a new fortress on the frontier. Small wonder that Zelensky now says Israel is a model to him. One of our guests tonight offers a crucial alternative to these framings. Vladimir Ryshenko is a Ukrainian sociologist who's been tracing since 2014 how this politics of civilizational conflict has played out in and punished Ukrainians. Tonight, though, he's going to be speaking also about how to think about Russian imperialism. Vladimir, welcome. Thank you. Another trap is to imagine Russia's war as purely defensive in a world in which only the United States has aggressive agency. This is, in fact, a relative novelty on the left. In Marx's generation, imperialism named a policy choice of expansionist states, Russia almost the worst among them. For Lenin's generation, imperialism instead named a structure of international competition into which several large states were locked, a need for aggression to maintain their position analogous to the capitalist imperative to expand accumulation or go under uh, in, uh, in the face of competition. Though Russia had a tiny industrial base, Lenin still considered it an imperialist power belonging in the same category as Britain or the United States, the same broad category, with Ukraine then chief among its objects of imperialist aggression alongside Finland and Poland. After 1945 though, the American takeover of imperial responsibility in Southeast Asia, in the Middle East, in South America, in Africa, from France and Britain and, and other powers, all seem to portend a newly singular imperial actor to those on the left 
who viewed Soviet power as anti-colonial, not all did, of course. Thinking of imperialism as a label for American policy alone now becomes a reassuring move in a world of left weakness, since it allows us to imagine that far away in Moscow or in Beijing, there are some good guys with tanks. It is an increasingly tragic view, while Putin builds links with a global far right and sponsors a politics of civilizational supremacy and authoritarian populism. Both imperial blocs mirror each other, though they're not identical, as they respond to the same spiraling crises in the world order. Well, to think about Russia today, I'm honored that we're joined as well as Vladimir by Ilya Matviev, philosopher, political theorist, writer on Russian imperialism and protester in Russian streets. I'm glad you can find some relative safety and join us today. Welcome, Ilya. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, and first, before we begin, I want to extend our solidarity to both of you at an excruciating and very tragic time. Um, in one recent interview, uh, Vladimir said, the Ukraine in which I was born and where I lived most of my life is lost now forever. However, this war ends. And I'm sure you both feel uh, in, in Russia and in Ukraine that the consequences of this war are not just the deadly, uh, brutal loss of life, but also the, the casualty of so much uh, left politics and, and hope for a, for a better, more democratic society. So solidarity to both of you, an extremely difficult time, a very painful time, and we're very honored and delighted that you could both be with us today. I, um, I'm gonna start with, uh, by asking Ilya some questions about, um, about Russia and then, then, then bringing in Vladimir as well. Um, so I, I want to start really with something marginalized from most discussions now, which focus obsessively on the geopolitical plane. And that is to think about the structure of Russian capitalism, which is important to understand its, uh, its aggression uh, and important for those on the left who perhaps think that Russia is still something uh, kinder and gentler than, than, than American society. Um, so one common frame is to say that Russia was oligarchic in the 1990s. Um, it's increasingly Bonapartist state led now. Um, you've talked about how in 2001, there were only eight billionaires in Russia. By 2008, there were 87 billionaires in Russia. Um, you've also written about neoliberalism in Russia, about structural reforms in the 2000s, continuing privatizations, Russia's flat income tax rate of just 13 percent, the stripping back of pensions, raising of the retirement age um, uh, and uh, the, the difficulty of legal strike action. Um, how should we think about Russian economic policy, about the structure of Russian capitalism, given that in that same 2014 speech where Putin famously celebrated Crimea's integration into Russia, he also called for healthcare to transition to a private insurance model. Is Russia an oligarchy? Is it a neoliberal society just like the West? Is it a Bonapartist state very different from, from, from Western neoliberal societies? How should we think about Russian capitalism? Right. So that's a big topic, but I will start with the simple thing that Russia is by far not a kind of gentler place than the West, and it's actually the opposite. Inequality in Russia is um, absolutely dramatic and uh, qualitatively different, let's say, even from, uh, from America, which is probably the most unequal country in the West. So Russian inequality is, in fact, worse. And uh, what we see now is that... Um, in many ways, this war is uh, the result of this inequality because um, people in uh, extremely poor areas of Russia with uh, zero resources, with no prospects at all, where uh, hospitals and schools uh, you know, were closed since the Soviet period, they have been closing. And uh, the way the Soviet Union tried to develop those territories, uh, this gradually came to an end. And so these hopeless places, this is, uh, these are the places where the Russian army now draws its uh, recruits, actually. And what they offer them is, uh, let's say, two, three, four thousand dollars for a month uh, in war. And uh, for them, this is the kind of money that uh, they will literally never see in peacetime. And so uh, the financial motivation to go to war is actually absolutely real in those parts. And uh, um, to me, uh, to, to, to comprehend this picture, when you have Moscow as second largest, uh, um, say there is the second largest number of billionaires in, in a city. So Moscow is home to the second largest number of billionaires. And so some people in Moscow 
live lifestyles that are just you know un- unthinkably just ridiculously sort of rich and, and then you have people in those areas who survive on uh, 100 200 300 dollars a month and uh, they become you know they're recruiters in the army and they're now fighting and killing and dying uh and, and those people those people with super yachts and people with uh, uh private jets to carry their dogs to a dog uh, exhibition which is a real story from from some russian high-ranking government official he really hired the private jet to carry his dogs to a dog show so and then those people they're just sitting in the kremlin and uh things uh uh they things are things go normally for them yes they have some worries about their london property but what we've seen is that they swap this property for property in Dubai and they go to Dubai now to have their vacation. And basically they're okay. And, and, and people from the poorest areas of Russia, they're just dying and killing and, and committing atrocities in this world. Of course, this, these atrocities are not, you know, it's impossible to justify them. But what I'm saying is that in part, this war is also driven by this absolutely unthinkable uh, inequality, right? And in many ways, this inequality is the product of uh, previous uh, neoliberal policy. So um, you've mentioned uh, my work where I detailed uh, these kinds of policies. I I would say that even in comparison with uh, Ukraine, Russian regime was more effective in introducing neoliberal policies, right? So, uh, for instance, uh, uh, part of the pension was privatized in 2002. So um, healthcare, so what they call optimizing the network of healthcare facilities means basically cutting, cutting down those network. And uh, uh, the same with education, uh, constantly underfunded higher education that leads to the disappearance of, uh, uh, you know, places with scholarship, let's say, for, for most of Russian students. And uh, so most of them now pay uh, to, to have uh, higher education. And in Russia, there are no uh, so, so higher education loans like in the United States. So basically parents have to save money for, for many decades to, to, to give education to their children. So in many ways, Russian, the way Russian political economy is organized is just uh, extreme, extreme third world inequality uh, extreme uh, riches on one side and extreme poverty and misery on another side, right? But then there is the question of uh, how is this organized politically? So if we talk about oligarchy, oligarchy we presume that uh, uh, th- those oligarchs, those businessmen, they have political power. So um, in reality, uh, the Bonapartist concept is more applicable. So it's true that Russian regime is Bonapartist in the sense that until quite recently, it uh, served the interests of big business, the interests of capital, but capital did not have any political power. It does not have any political power in this regime. So uh, the oligarchs really are not oligarchs in that sense. They do not have political power because because they cannot influence uh, Putin's uh, decisions. This is uh, simply true. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, some of them actually <laughs> said that. So there is a guy from uh, Alpha Bank who is now living in London, and then he was stripped of all his assets, and uh, they they gave him a stipend of like two thousand uh, two thousand <coughs> two thousand pounds, and uh, he said, if you think that I can influence Putin and say, look, so <laughs> it's, a, it's such a problem for me. Can you stop this war? That this is not how it works. And actually, this guy is right. This billionaire is right. So this is not how it works. The billionaires cannot stop uh, the war because they have no political influence uh, in this uh, situation. Mm. And then the question is, <clears throat> how did it happen that... Uh, the billionaires, they might not have political power, but economically, they were in a privileged position. So how did it happen that uh, the economic interests of capitalists were also sacrificed in this war to a dramatic extent? So Russian billionaires uh, are hurt by this war uh, in multiple ways. So sanctions, the destruction of their businesses, the destruction of 
export markets for them, the destruction of their production capacity, uh, complete lack of finance, so every, everything. In terms of uh, the position of capital right now, this is a disaster for them. And then the question is, uh, how, how could this regime uh, shift from uh, serving their interests even though they do not have political power, to denying them everything, you know, in favor of this uh, war of conquest. So this is a really complicated question that uh, I'm only trying to, to answer right now with my analysis. And before we get there to that analysis, which I'll come to in just a moment, I want to ask you how progressive left kinds of opposition uh, uh, figure in this story, uh, what, what the strength is of more hopeful currents. You've written about the opening up and then partial closing down of that 2011 to 12 moment in protests around electoral fraud. We then saw in recent election the Communist Party up to 20% uh, uh, in, in second place in the polls, a party that often speaks a language of, aggression, Russia, of aggressive Russian nationalism, uh, combined with some kind of criticism of oligarchs. But there were individual figures like uh, Mikhail Lobanov, the Moscow State University uh, uh, academic, who ran a sort of left campaign, uh, much more clearly left progressive campaign, though under the auspices of the Communist Party, won his seat and then was denied it uh, in, in the Duma. So what kind of space is there uh, of, of a critical uh, uh, politics in Russia against both its economic and its geopolitical entanglements, and and how's that been changed by the war? Right. So, I mean, Mikhail is uh, a heroic figure, and I uh, applaud him for staying in Moscow and trying to organize kind of still a kind of grassroots activism even at this moment. But uh, we have to admit that there is no space for any kind of independent political action in Russia right now. Simply no space, because uh, every organized structure of the opposition was destroyed even before uh, the war. So the Communist Party is 100% controlled uh, by the Kremlin. So it's not uh, an independent structure. We cannot even call it opposition. Yes, there were some processes within the Communist Party, that were accelerated by, you know, recent elections. And uh, Alexei Navalny basically asked people to vote for the Communist Party in his uh, sort of tactical voting strategy. And uh, this uh, triggered some processes of uh, internal split within the Communist Party because some people there wanted to capitalize on that and wanted to have some kind of independent politics. But this was basically uh, just nipped in the bud, nipped in the bud by the government. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have like optimistic takes in this moment. So it's a pretty bleak picture because uh, since the start of the war, it's basically martial law in Russia. It was not announced, but it is uh, present. So uh, e e every, e every protest is criminalized. Every protest, e every in, e whatever you try to do, anything is uh, denied. So one example is um, this woman who tried to replace uh, price tags in a supermarket with anti-war messages which is a very subtle, but I think uh, rather, you know, effective way to, uh, to, to protest and to demonstrate anti-war position. So to replace the, this price tax. And then she was arrested for that. And now she can go to prison for up to 10 years. So basically any kind of action which is against the war and against the regime, anything is uh, impossible right now in Russia. So very hard to be hopeful. Uh, and then, of course, uh, hundreds of thousands of people left Russia, among them uh, a lot of activists, a lot of uh, politicians, because, uh, well, because they fear for, for their freedom and maybe even uh, for their life. So, yeah. Okay, one last question to you, bringing all this together then, and then we'll come back. But, but one last question for now, and then uh, I'm going to bring Vladimir in on this. Um, so you've given us this picture of a state transitioning economically and politically, um, neoliberalism and authoritarianism combined. Um, that's built for you when you add in a third element to that story, which is massive economic crises, um, the, the, the loss of the 8% growth rates of the early 2000s since 2008. Those three things seem to build for you a picture of a change in what we should mean when we talk about Russian imperialism, as you think we should and a change from our ability to use traditionally Marxist frames to talk about it in economic terms 
Mm-hmm. to a much more heavily political framing. And I think Vladimir has disagreed a little about this. So I wanted to ask both of you, but but, but first, Ilya, if you could give us a, a sense of that argument. Right. So in that article, academic article that I've written, the argument is that up until 2014, Russian imperialism uh, combined political and economic uh, components because uh, Russian business uh, had interests in uh, post-Soviet space, and, uh, and, and so the Kremlin um, secured the interests of Russian corporations in post-Soviet countries. Essentially, there was a, a sort of a synergy between uh, uh, Russian foreign policy, aggressive foreign policy, and the interests of Russian business. More or less, they were not exactly identical, those trends, but there was a synergy between them. And what I argue is that in 2014, uh, this completely changed. And uh, uh, there is uh, a gap between economic interests of business and, uh, you know, political actions of the government. Because, uh, mm, so, uh, Crimea created the sanctions situation, which is very harmful to Russian business, in fact. Uh, The war in Donbass uh, further sort of harmed the interests of the oligarchs. And then the current war, completely, you know, destroys uh, their, their position. And uh, economically, so Russian economy is basically finished. So, like, in terms of just generally looking at the state of the Russian economy, so maybe it will be able to survive for some time because it's not that easy to cut off uh, gas uh, from, you know, European countries. They still need it for, for their economies to function. But beyond that, Russian economy is more or less finished. And uh, the oligarchs, for them, it's the choice of uh, just trying to flee Russia and say that they have nothing to do with it or uh, staying in Russia and seeing their profits uh, dwindle and uh, the prospects of global or even regional expansion dwindle. So this war is incompatible with uh, capital accumulation, I would say. Maybe in 10 years, in 20 years, some kind of economic uh, sort of... uh, so. um, it like economic activity will find a way in this politic geopolitical situation but uh, medium term prospects for russian economy are very bad right so uh, in that sense it's uh, it 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 is indeed quite hard to apply uh, leftist understanding of imperialism to this war because you cannot see economic rationality economic interests uh, in this war but then again uh, what i argued in the article is that if we look at uh, iraq for instance, it's not like there was a direct economic uh, motivation for invasion of Iraq in 2003. So there was uh, some kind of distant motivation that maybe if uh, the United States controls the whole of Middle East, then uh, as David Harvey wrote, uh, so America controls uh, oil supply in the world, and this gives it dramatic uh, you know, economic leverage. But this is such a distant uh, prospect, and this never happened, in fact, right? So in that sense, the war in Iraq was also not economically motivated. It was, in fact, it was probably harmful for American economy. In the long run, you know, there's those trillions of dollars spent on this war, probably it was just a destruction of value. And so in that sense, maybe uh, this Russian war of conquest is not, is not such a big exception, because we cannot automatically assume economic motives behind every imperialist war, right? And uh, it, it's, a, it's an uneasy relationship between war and the economy. Maybe some wars can profit some businessmen, but it's absolutely not like an automatic relationship, right? Yeah, this, this point you're raising about the different temporal scales, the short run and the long run, um, is I think very important in terms of, uh, of both America and Russia identifying this kind of open moment of a declining American hegemony, rising Chinese power, as a moment where the Russian state can accept its weakness and isolation as a kind of finale of American power, or can try to make the gamble it made in Syria, uh, which seems to have paid off, uh, to to establishing more regional uh, solidity and to approaching China from a position of greater kind of strength. So that so that it's interesting you. The way I first read the article was was much more thoroughly on the sort of this is this is all political, not economics. But what you're saying here is actually uh, thinking about the short term and the long run sort of muddles that distinction a little bit in ways that I think are quite 
quite useful. The Iraq analogy is interesting. Also, Giovanni Arrighi makes this in, made this interesting argument about the Iraq war, that it was already American thinking was about China, that it was about trying to show to the Chinese state that America had got over Vietnam syndrome, was able to uh, launch uh, launch imperial attacks. Um, I want to, to, to bring in uh, Vladimir here. There's that, there's so much that, that we could ask. Um, but let's just start on, on, on this question, because um, you have also been thinking about uh, what explains this Russian attack. And I think it would be fair to say that you, like much of the, like most, like many Ukrainians and, and like much of the left around the world, uh, were quite surprised, weren't expecting that Russia would launch a, a military onslaught on this scale. So what do you think, uh, what do you think are the best ways that we can think about why this was happening and, and what led to it? Uh, yeah, thank you so much um, for the question. And that's exactly the question where I, uh at this moment tend to disagree with Ilya uh, because uh, I'm, I'm feeling like a kind of like very, very skeptical about this irrationality explanation that uh, that became kind of like uh, quite popular in uh, in the press, but also among the activists, among the scholars that like Putin was uh, became uh, isolated during COVID pandemic. He talked only to about like a handful of people. Those people had very freaky ideas. He was reading some obscure Russian philosophers from like hundreds of years with sympathies to fascists, like Ilya and so on and so forth. So he basically turned the kind of like mad. And instead of just saying that he he's a crazy, insane madman, as it's actually been said in many of the uh, articles about the war, we just cannot make any sense of this war because it's just so, so it doesn't, just doesn't make sense neither for Putin nor for Russian uh, ruling class nor for anyone, so we should assume that some just crazy rationality is driving Putin, if not psychological, mental disease, then, then it's probably some ideological fanaticism. And uh, I, I, I find it very uh, kind of like unconvincing. I mean, one thing is it's just we cannot verify it. And for me as a social scientist, it's important to base my analysis, not simply on some of the rumors by the insider sources about what was happening with Putin in the last like year or two. Uh, but uh, another thing is that actually this is kind of like a false consciousness argument that Putin is actually working against his best interests and just digging his own grave. And we know that uh, usually those false conscious, uh, consciousness arguments uh, prove to be false. I think there is rationality and uh, it's very important to bring a distinction between uh, short-term and long-term interests and the interests of specific uh, capitalists and the general interest of the ruling class in Russia. And I would uh, tend to argue that uh, the war was actually a, a rational uh, implementation of the collective interests of Russian ruling class. But we, we should understand what, what, uh, what is the nature of this class. And uh, as many scholars, I would uh, uh, call it like political capitalists, this barbarian term, the capitalists who, whose primary way to make money very much depends on the exploitation of the political offices, on the use of the selective preferences from the state, and these are their primary competitive advantage. Not exactly a technological innovation that Russia cannot actually be proud of so many, at least in the post-Soviet period. Not exactly a, an exploitation of a cheap labor force, because Russian labor force is not exactly the cheapest in the third world, but exploitation of the, of the state. And uh, if you think about this specific uh, way, uh, this specific group of capitalists, then we would start to understand where this whole obsession with Russian sovereignty, with Russian spheres of influence comes from. Because if you make your wealth from the exploitation of the state, you are very much interested in the full monopoly sovereign control over the state and not allowing any of the uh, attempts to get over the state by the transnational capital, uh, not by any other class factions, other classes, that's uh, all this uh, sovereignty obsession by Putin is actually very, very rational. 
in the long period, in the perspective of the general class interests. And this connects very well, actually, with the theory of Bonapartism, because Bonapartism is exactly a regime which uh, allows an autonomous state power to enforce, not actually to convince in a hegemonic way, but exactly to coerce and enforce the general class interests of, over, the, uh, over the ruling class. Uh, which uh, some specific factions or individual capitalists may have uh, may not be exactly uh, happy about, and they may actually lose in the current situation of the war. But in the long term perspective, uh, Putin may actually be uh, working in the rational collective interests of that particular ruling class, as it has established in the post-Soviet Russia. And in the process of the war, he also uh, may try to overcome some of the fundamental problems with the Bonapartist regimes that are actually not exactly stable. They are uh, fragile and they are uh, um, they are uh, quite often suffering the problems with the succession. Who would succeed Putin when he would be like 80 years old? When he would be physically incapable to run uh, the, the country? And this problem of succession of this personalistic autocratic regimes is actually very huge. It is a big problem. And that's why uh, exactly we had uh, an uprising in Belarus in 2020. That's why we had an uprising in Kazakhstan this January. And the regimes that uh, most of the political scientists didn't even uh, expect it that they would have massive uprisings because like, Lukashenko was ruling Belarus since 1994, Nazarbayev was ruling Kazakhstan since 1986, and these were kind of like uh, the icons of stable autocracies. Some even call them consolidated authoritarianism. But they, they proved to be not, not so much consolidated, and they, uh, as we've seen, they survived primarily because of the Russian intervention in support of them. And, but what would happen uh, in case of Russia? Who would actually help Putin in case of something like in Belarus or in Kazakhstan? And maybe even more violent. So this, uh, this problem of how to organize your own succession and not to be killed, arrested, uh, moved in, into some emigration from the country by your own successor, or by the coup d'etat, and th this kind of regimes meet many, many problems. Uh, th th that's a thing that could actually be uh, on Putin's mind. And what, what happens now during the war that he is bringing more mobilizationist, more um, uh, repressive, at the same time more ideological elements to the regime, which is, of course, it's uh, in the making, and uh, it would be uh, like preliminary to, to, to say in which exactly direction it's moving. Some people are calling it like fascism already. I mean, there are some elements that make uh, the transformations of Putin's regime right now a little bit similar to fascism, but again, that's uh, a lot in the making and we would need to see how it develops. But in any case, uh, the war is actually an opportunity to uh, build a more stable, more powerful and more consolidated political regime in Russia that would be more capable to enforce uh, and to defend, protect the interests of the Russian ruling class. All right. So can, can I comment on this? Of course, of course. Yeah. So, um, actually, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Valodin's arguments, they're very logical. They make sense on the logical level. But uh, I still disagree because I think uh, uh, the facts uh, contradict uh, wh what he said. Because uh, um, the first thing is rationality. So, I didn't say that Putin is irrational. I said that there is no economic rationality. Maybe there is some other kind of rationality there. I would say that, yes, there is uh, what he thinks is geopolitical rationality, but it's not economic, right? But then, more interesting thing is about Russian ruling class. So, uh, 
I agree. We can call this political capitalism. So that's probably the dominant tendency. In Russia, it's true that uh, capitalists accumulate capital because of their closeness to political office, right? But then the question is, uh, will they be able to accumulate any capital at all after this war? And I'm actually not sure because Russian economy is already being destroyed, like I said. So uh, it will be, you know, completely demolished because of this uh, embargo on Russian oil, for instance, uh, gradual uh, decrease in gas exports and uh, the loss of export markets, the loss of um, the loss of investment, loss of financing. So Russian economy is uh, integrated into a global economy. And then it is now being uh, deglobalized. So these ties with global economy are being destroyed. And then uh, I can I cannot I cannot see any way to replace this global regime of accumulation. You know, that depends on this global integration. So some kind of internal internal accumulation of capital within Russia, I, I don't see how that's possible because there is, no, there is no money. There is going to be no money. There is going, just going to be a very, very poor uh, country. And uh, for the ruling class, even for not just for, uh, you know, businessmen, but just for politicians in terms of corruption, in terms of just using their office for uh, stealing money, it would have been much better to avoid the war and to continue reaping the benefits from uh, gas sales, oil sales to the West, and uh, general you know, economic interaction with the West. And this is, I think, what the West actually expected, that Russia will not uh, pursue this war because uh, Russian elite will try to uh, capitalize and exploit these ties with the West. So corruption will help to avoid the war. But it uh, appeared to be uh, not true. Right. So in that sense, um, I, I, I don't see that uh, the war is beneficial. Maybe, like I said, in very long term, like in 20 years, if Russia is able to win something in, in this war, I think uh, it won't be able to win anything. But they might have thought that maybe if we capture Ukraine, if we seize Ukraine, then this huge uh, economic block of two big countries will ultimately be able to develop, you know, so it, it will be good for, for, for Russian economy in the, in the long run. Maybe in like 20 years, Russia and Ukraine together will be a strong economic bloc that is able to compete with the European Union, for instance, and with China. So maybe they thought in this way, but it's a very, very distant prospect. What we see now is just the destruction of the lives of those oligarchs. So I'm not, I'm not really pitying them, but it's, it's just very clear that they're just losing money. They're losing everything right now. But then the more interesting story is, uh, again, even more interesting. It's the story with the consolidation of the regime, right? And this argument, it, it's actually, yes, I agree it makes sense that for Putin, it makes sense to consolidate his elites by you know, just forcing them together because of this war, they have no other option. And now they have to stick uh, to Putin because they cannot go anywhere else. And uh, there are some signs that this is already happening, actually, that uh, like some Russian bureaucrats, they, they understand that they're now tied forever to Russia, they're tied to this regime, and they, they sort of lost any thoughts about trying to do something because now they're tied to Putin forever, right? But at the same time, um, the war is going to be very unpopular in the population very soon. I think it is already starting to be unpopular. And in terms of uh, popular opposition to the regime, things will get worse, not better, right? And so uh, Bonapartism depends on uh, plebiscitarian, you know, sort of approval by the population. So people need to approve of their leader. And if the, if the war goes on for some time, then uh, they, they will not approve of their leader. And so maybe uh, Russia will lose just like Napoleon III, right? So something like this will happen because he also lost the war, as I remember. So um, I think that uh, in, ter it just, it, in terms of just uh, avoiding risk, avoiding war would have been better for Putin. Now risk to his own power is bigger than it was before. Yeah. May I add? Uh, I, I want to say yeah, one thing, pushing back and then come back to you, uh, Vladimir, as well, who I'm sure will push back as well, which is just that it seems to me that what's missed in what uh, Ilya is saying is, um, is, is a possibility that this is a kind of gamble that went wrong. So that 
Um, Ukraine is clearly economically important to as a kind of semi-colonial sphere for the investment of Russian capital. Part of that doomed Yanukovych-Putin deal in uh, 2014 that was torn apart by Maidan involved right. $3 billion flowing from Ukraine to Russia in supposed uh, debt payments. Um, it's not a level of economic importance that justifies massive casualties, including senior Russian officers and a long war. But if Russia thought that this would look a bit like Georgia in 2008, where, the, where there were some skirmishes, they were able to claim a quick victory and uh, put part of the, the autonomous territory under their control, then it might be a sort of reasonable gamble. So it seems to me there is a kind of functionalist fallacy in thinking maybe, in thinking, um, well, it hasn't worked out, so that can't be the reason that, uh, that, that um, this, was, this, was, this was begun. But I, I want to, sorry to launch that at you, I want to go to Vladimir because I know he was desperate to uh, bring in more. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I, I would not uh, uh, agree that Ukraine is primarily economically interesting for Russia. It's not exactly the like an economically interesting country. I mean, nobody wanted to invest into Ukraine. If you look at the foreign direct investments to, the, to, to, to Ukraine, and there was a reason for this, and I'm not clear why exactly Russia would like to you to, to start a war in Ukraine in order to to invest where into to, into the destroyed country. I mean, mm, uh, yeah, that, uh, that, 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 that's a problem. But I, I would uh, I actually would develop an argument that that what Ilyas calls a geopolitical rationality is also in the final instance economic. And yes, uh, we, we actually, we have some evidence, and some people uh, were some of the analysts of the Russian uh, regime and Russian politics were pointing to this fact that Putin may actually, indeed, may think in a very long-term perspective as if like fulfilling a historical mission for Russia, and may, may indeed may think not about the immediate problems for the uh, Russian economy, but what would happen in 20 years. And in 20 years, together with Ukraine, Russia would be more powerful with a stronger regime, with a, a stronger position within the uh, world system, and that would be all justified in, in that reasoning. And um, I mean, yeah, I, uh, there are many people like Ilya who argue that the economic consequences for for Russian economy would be just disastrous, and it's not clear how Russia would survive. I mean, the, um, reading the more like loyal to Kremlin experts, uh, they're quite optimistic, actually, and they see the war as an opportunity of the overcoming some of the dependencies on the Western capital, on the Western economies, uh, and opportunities for import substitution, for reorientation of the uh, Russian export, for developing some of the high added value production within Russia. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that sounds like the Samira means the linking of, of the uh, of, of the state, uh, of course, not in a kind of like progressive way, uh, but perhaps in the class interests of Russian political capitalists. Of course, in a longer perspective, not simply in the um, vision of just several years. And yes, if you uh, look at this from the perspective of risk aversion, that was like the crazy idea, of course. But if you look at the uh, Russian uh, economy and Russian state, it's not exactly that powerful and not exactly that stable. And the Bonapartist regimes are never stable. I mean, the, 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 any personalist regime is at the huge risk of uh, collapse of, uh, uh, right after the uh, uh, leader is uh, not physically capable to continue the rule and we, we can find many examples in the history when the great empires were just collapsing after the founder was about to die and th th that exactly may be may be clearly understood by the russian ruling clique that there should be some fundamental transformation of uh, russian political regime from bonapartism to something else 
that uh, the war is actually a great opportunity to do this because it consolidates the elite, uh, it also consolidates uh, the society at least for some moment, and then, yeah, we'll see. Then, of course, it depends on the on on how, on how many casualties would be of the Russian army, how the whatever would happen on Ukrainian battlefields and so on and so forth. And of course, some some miscalculation of how easy it would be to conquer Ukraine. Of course, it contributed to the decision to start the war. Uh, but it's not just a miscalculation, it's not just some ideological irrationality. Uh, there is uh, much more of the rational interest in starting of the war. And I think it's much more productive to, uh, to think about Russian imperialism, about the war, specifically about the war in this, uh, with some connection to the economic basis. As as Marxists, we are supposed to do. Briefly, Ilya, and then I so, want to ask about something else. Yeah, so just, uh, just a clarifying question. So, but how do you think the war can help with the problem of succession? So how can it help with replacing Putin with someone else from, from, like, from the regime? Like, institutionally, how can it help with this problem? Uh, I mean, w w one way is actually to start uh, organizing this institution of succession. And mm -hmm. in order to do this, uh, because the, every, uh, in, practically in every regime, the succession problems is exactly the point when the elites are starting to quarrel with each other and fighting who would be the next successor. So right. in the situation of elite consolidation, choosing a successor, for example, like, I don't know what, what, what are now the relations with Shrigu, but if he would be a leader of like successful victorious war, that would be right. a very clear candidate for a successor, a person who actually brought Ukraine to Russia and like a national hero for many years. That would give a very high legitimacy to a successor, and uh, so the, the, uh, there would be. Uh, so the war is uh, creating more like favorable uh, uh, opportunities to uh, right. solve a, a problem that is always under risk of um, triggering elite defection, elite uh, splits, and so on, which are always a very important for the coup d'etats and for the revolutions. Right, so can I br briefly respond to this? Because I actually disagree with this specific sort of argument, because I think that uh, the war will make succession more difficult for Putin, because now there is a huge part of the elite that will be uh, trying to create their own guy, you know, to to replace Putin in order to improve relations with the West, in order to improve Russia's economic situation because of that, in order to break, uh, you know, the isolation from the world that is created by this war. So actually now there is a huge group and I think it's already happening. A lot of people are already talking to each other and devising strategies to uh, push their own guy to replace Putin, you know, uh, in order to, uh, well, in order to lift the sanctions, in order to try to get some peace with the West, something like this, right? And before that, it was not like that. Before that, it was actually easier to nominate someone, okay, Shaigu, whatever, right? And then uh, the TV will do its job by increasing legitimacy of Shaigu. So they will just uh, use propaganda we to should, say we that... Should say we should say to him, he's the Russian defense minister, we should explain to him. Yeah, 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 so Russian defense minister. So, But it, it doesn't even matter, someone close to Putin, right? So they will just pick a guy, and they will say he's the next Putin, and they will use the TV to push it on the population. And this would have worked actually perfectly. But now there's a problem, because a lot of people, even in Putin's circle, they are now like, okay, but maybe we should, uh, you know, have some kind of our own game in this, and maybe we should try to... Uh, to have our own guy who will have uh, who will not be a successor to Putin, but who will have the opposite uh, 
and political strategy. So who will try to improve relations with uh, the West, with Ukraine, with everyone else in order to lift uh, this economic blockade. Right. So uh, in that sense, I think that Putin is now he can only hope that his health is very good so he can postpone this question far into the future. And this is why he's actually so careful about his health, because he understands that while, while he's healthy, so the regime will stand. But if something happens to him, this will be a much bigger problem now after the war than it was before the war. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> one, already, and then we might yeah, talk about different yeah, things. Uh, one, one, more, yeah. one, one thing to, I, I mean, if there is indeed uh, this kind of like um, starting elite conspiracies about some successor to Putin or maybe even a coup d'état against Putin, uh, the problem is that uh, whoever they choose to succeed, to succeed Putin, he won't be. It won't be very easy for him to simply to withdraw from Ukraine. At the moment of uh, when, when they are already uh, kind of like establishing Russian authorities in, in the thousand Ukraine in the occupied Kherson and large part of Zapor Zaporozhye regions, and uh, they are kind of like about to occupy the whole Donbass, and uh, any um, peace settlement with uh, Ukraine on the kind of like capitulation terms for Russia. Would, would like 100 percent would uh, require to move the forces away from a large part of Ukraine, which will, won't be actually popular in Russia right now. And uh, even more so, uh, if Russia would kind of like calling for, uh, we are going to surrender, but please just lift the sanctions, they might uh, re 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 require from them to uh, leave the whole of Donbass, including DNR and LNR, Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republic, even, even probably Crimea. Crimea as well, yeah. Yeah, and Crimea as well. So uh, whoever would succeed Putin in this situation, uh, whatever those like groups of elites are thinking, uh, he would be in an extremely difficult situation. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure how this calculation may work. Uh, that that would, would uh, actually require uh, like a full capitulation of Russia with uh, huge risks for internal stability and for uh, armed uh, resistance against this uh, new new government and other splits of the elites, specifically from the Silaviki uh, part, from the military, from the secu security services. So that, that's uh, even probably even more risk than the, was starting the war. I want, to, I want to move us on to, we've been focusing on Russia, um, you've both written, I think, very importantly, uh, in opposition to a developing language on both sides of a kind of stark difference, a uh, kind of clash of civilizations in which these two societies and states and, and, and economies are utterly different. Um, and, and Vladimir, especially, you've, you, you, you've uh, I think a lot of your writing has shown a kind of mirroring where the tendency towards increasingly authoritarian, increasingly nationalist politics in Russia is also the tendency in Ukraine since 2014, that if war is a radicalizing move, a uh, radicalizing moment for politics in Russia, it's also been an eight year long war as a, as a, as a radicalizing moment for, for nationalist politics in Ukraine against the kind of simple binary between uh, uh, authoritarian Russia and democratic Europe, kind of racialized binary. Um, and also against the idea of a kind of expansionist imperialism and a democratic imperialism, that old language, uh, which now again is, is kind of implicitly used to, to think about uh, um, NATO and, and, and America and Western action, EU action uh, in, in Ukraine. So I wanted to ask you something about a term that has, be, that has been circulated now, uh, which is this language of West-splaining, which is the claim that much of the left globally is so concerned with trying to make the West responsible for everything um, uh, that, that, that ignores uh, moments where the West is just not responsible at all. And we've just been having a discussion about Russian imperialism. Um, you've also written about domestic Ukrainian histories, local histories that play a, a, a very important role in, in, in generating right wing politics. It's not just about American manipulation. Um, but you've also found room for thinking about the aggressive role of NATO and the EU and, and, and their relationships, different relationships, historically quite different 
now more similar to Ukraine. So I just wanted to ask you um, what you think of that uh, opposition to West Spain and the kind of fissures now developing on the left in terms of uh, in our fury about Russia's invasion, how much weight we give to thinking about Western imperialism too and about domestic problems in, in, in Ukrainian nationalism? Uh... I mean, there are many superficial arguments uh, that uh, are popular among the left, and uh, the left theory is not exactly at the best uh, situation right now, and not not only about Ukraine, about many things. And we, we are not exactly in the in the situation when, like Lenin was arguing with Rosa Luxemburg and Kautsky, and these were like, like the greatest minds, or even in the situation of 1960s and 70s, Marxist theory is unfortunately in a crisis. And uh, and that West Plain, you know, whatever, is just a very small part of that, that crisis. And exactly cr- criticizing the tendencies as a West Plain is not exactly a um, Marxist way to to develop this discussion, just uh, using this identity politics language in order to to bring a very weak arguments. I mean, the problem is that uh, uh, it's it's always simplistic uh, to to say that I mean Russian imperialism is just about the same as Western imperialism. Although, if, of course, it's uh, meaningful to talk about Russian imperialism, but then what exactly we mean by this? And uh, Barnaby, you've, you've started the discussion with, uh, with, with how Lenin was analyzing Russian imperialism. But Lenin also understood that Russian imperialism, even before the First World War, was, uh, was significantly different from the imperialism of England, France, Germany. Uh, the uh, Le- Lenin point pointed that Russian imperialism is more militaristic, is more like kind of like feudal bureaucratic, as he called it. It's it it, it was not exactly about expansion of finance capital, and this war, if we, uh, we we can analyze it in terms of Russian imperialism, and we can co- actually connect it into the long term economic interests of Russian ruling class, as I try to argue. Uh, but it's again, it's not exactly about expansion of Russian capital to Ukraine. I, I find this idea was, it's very, very um, problematic. So that's uh, that's a complication of this uh, of this argument. So. Right. If, 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 if in Iraq, if we, are, we are talking about American imperialism, that in case of Ukraine, we should talk about Russian imperialism, meaning something like American imperialism, although it is not exactly like this. And this kind of uh, West Plaining, not West Plaining uh, discussion is not moving the understanding of what's going on in Ukraine and in Russia. Uh, to to a better and more um, and clearer and more precise understanding of the causes and of the developments and of uh, of the of the left and solutions for the war and and that also counts on this um, mirroring of uh, the Russia Ukraine relations that on the one hand we have like authoritarian nationalist politics in Russia but also on the other hand the war brings authoritarian nationalist politics to Ukraine that again that doesn't work exactly like this and uh, the the differences between Ukrainian nationalism and Russian nationalism are significant and uh, for the left it's uh, it's always been uh, I mean at least for a large part of the left Okay, yes, Rosa Luxemburg, of course, had a different argument that all nationalism are, are bad. And so, some parts of the left are now kind of, uh, coming to understanding Rosa Luxemburg better, seeing how these nationalist arguments are now entering the left wing discussion about Ukraine. But, uh, I mean, other parts of the left always argued that uh, the nationalists, the nationalisms are actually maybe different. They could be reactionary nationalism, it could be progressive nationalism. 
And uh, of course, for some parts of the left, it's uh, very susceptible to argue that Ukraine is fighting for its national liberation, and you cannot uh, equate Russian nationalism to Ukrainian nationalism. On the other hand, it's um, I mean the Ukrainian nation building project has uh, uh, has been problematic, to say the least. I mean, one part of it is uh, that, uh, I mean, comparing Ukrainian nationalism, or at least its dominant version, um, it's not exactly like Palestinian nationalism, for example. It's not exactly like uh, the progressive third world nationalism in, my, in the Global South countries. I mean, uh, the, the, that uh, quote from Zelensky, which became quite viral in, in the recent weeks, that Ukraine is going to become an Israel. In, in in Eastern Europe. I mean, that says a lot. That says that Ukrainian nationalists do not actually feel the solidarity with the oppressed people in the global south, but they feel more like connection to the uh, Western elites. And that's also a part of the problem with those critics of so-called West Planning, that they are very obsessed with the problems of the Western left argument, so-called Western left, that they are not feeling that uh, a, a large part of the arguments, it's just just word by word what, what the Washington Post or the New York Times is publishing. And they, 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 they are not capable to take a critical distance from the arguments of the Western elites. So, Th 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 that is a part of the, with, with the dominant Ukrainian nationalism. Then it's another part uh, that uh, it's at least before the war, be uh, before the moment, before we, we could actually have some reliable data on Ukrainian citizens' attitudes, those that kind of nationalism was not actually hegemonic in Ukraine, and there's been a large part of the population. Uh, on some issues, a large minority. On some issues, it was actually a majority of Ukrainians who were not, who did not agree with Ukrainian nationalists. On some of the uh, fundamental issues of the uh, that nation building project. So that project, that nation building project was fragile. And uh, now this part of the population, of course, it's uh, during the war, it's. Uh, it's a great transformative process, and many people are changing their identities, they shift in their attitudes, uh, shift in their positions, and some of the people who could earlier call themselves both Ukrainians and Russians, and it was kind of like normal for at least 15% of Ukrainian population, even after Crimea, even after Donbass, even a very aggressive actions by Russia, that of, be, before that there were even more people like this. Now, of course, for, for them, it could be, uh, they could be put into the, they would be required to choose, are they Ukrainians or they are Russians? Yeah. Uh, at the same time, we also know that these identities are very durable. And even uh, the even like greater wars, like the First World War, like the Second World War, even all the tragedies of the 20th century that happened in Ukraine, uh, they uh, did not erase the differences between uh, different Ukrainians from different regions. And so uh, our perception of what's going on with this war may also be kind of like biased and uh, premature. So it's quite possible that the differences between Ukrainians would remain, and then it would be uh, then it would be a question whether other Ukrainians not exactly fitting the dominant Ukrainian nationalism project would they have any political representation in the post-war Ukraine? Or they would be treated as 100% uh, fifth column, without any rights, without any possibility to to uh, to have their parties, uh, which are actually banned right now, without uh, any um, space for expression in the public sphere, um, and 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 that's a, that's a problem. That's of course the the, the, the problem that should, we should we should keep in mind. And 
it, the, the, the word does not exactly uh, work like this in this uh, very simplistic uh, symmetrical arguments where we put uh, Russian imperialism in the same role with Western imperialism or Ukrainian nationalism in the same role with Russian nationalism. Mm -hmm. So uh, can I develop this a little? Yeah, oh, sure. Then I want to come back and ask Vladimir another question, but sure. Right. So, uh, actually, I would agree with uh, the first the first part of what uh, Valody is saying, and uh, I would use uh, your own editorial from <laughs> from Salvage as an example. Actually, I know Barnaby that you've written uh, a large part of this uh, of this text, so a long one, right? Uh, introducing this conflict, and uh, what I noticed is that, of course, it's uh, one of the most intelligent like treatments of uh, the war, but at the same time, so I was reading it and I was uh, waiting for your own characterization of Russian imperialism. And then I didn't actually uh, get it because the most that you are saying is that it's just a mirror of the West. And it's true. Unfortunately, it's true about your text as well. So uh, there, there is no like real attempt, maybe, maybe some phrases, but no, no like analysis of the specificity of Russian imperialism and uh, its genealogy, its history, its prospects, and so on. So, uh, I mean, yeah, so do you not agree with me on this? I have to, I have to come back, Ilya, because I don't think this is fair at all. Uh, not least because we engaged with your work in that editorial. We have a, a discussion sure. of your essay. And what we, what, what we say is that um, uh, a crucial, it's crucially different the way that imperialist actors operate based on their different position of strength. So it's very important that when America invaded Iraq, it didn't have to worry about the dollar swiftly tumbling in the way that the ruble did immediately after the invasion, because it was more of a unipolar hegemonic imperial actor. And so Russia acts constrained. And so part of the reason that Russia didn't carry out the kind of totally savage uh, a bombing campaign that America did at the beginning of the war in Iraq is, is surely partly because of, uh, Russia has to worry about how other states will react and perhaps was gambling on a less united and aggressive Western reaction. So I think we do talk about differences, different kinds of criticism. What we also say, certainly what I say is I'm not uh, a scholar as you are of Russian imperialism and was not trying to set out a theory of what Russian imperialism was. What the article was trying to do, and I'll come to both of you on this, was to say uh, this is the, this is an inter-imperialist conflict, not just what's happening now in Ukraine, but a developing moment of inter-imperialist hostilities. And we have too little analysis of the fact that it's an inter-imperialist moment, the fact that capitalism is increasingly organized behind rival imperial blocs. Um, and so we need to think, and, and I'm, you know, as both of you are saying, I mean, I mean uh, uh, Vladimir was talking about how Lenin even talked about Russian and Western imperialism as different. Lenin also was writing a century ago. And uh, it, it's strange that Lenin was writing and saying what Marx was saying 50 years ago is outdated now because we've got a new fusion of state and finance capital. And yet today, a century later, people still want to return not just to the category imperialism, but to the precise historical moment of Lenin Luxembourg, which, as Vladimir said, is an amazingly uh, breathtakingly fertile intellectual moment because the left had answers. We don't now. So the essay was really trying not to give answers, as we so often do in salvage, but to set out the need for a kind of research program. We need to think about what inter-imperialist conflict looks like today because it's not the same as it was a century ago. And the mirroring that we wanted to raise was to say that in both Russia and the West, in response to the, the kind of crisis of neoliberalism, just as happened globally in the transition to neoliberalism, there is a rising politics of culture wars, moral panics, authoritarian populism. And this kind of thin similarity is, is worth thinking about as a, as a moment in which you cohere a mass populist politics without an emancipatory pole, without the presence of the left. And that is a thin similarity. So that, so that in Donbass today, you have militias on both sides, some militias fighting under the banner of the swastika. You have, far, and, and more broadly, far right forces on both sides. And so what we wanted to do in the essay was to think through both the presence of inter-imperialist conflict now and also the presence of that conflict without, and this gets to the problems of Cold War analogies, right, right. any kind of massive emancipatory pole organized globally. So an inter-imperialist conflict in which both sides are pushing an increasingly chauvinistic nationalist politics in response to capitalist crisis. That's the broad kind of framework to defend some of our salvage right. contribution. No, absolutely. So I'm I'm not even like harshly criticizing it. I, it was just for me. It was sort of symptomatic because because I'm grateful that you referred to my paper. But I felt that you did that 
and then you do not develop the things that I was writing about. Instead, you just sort of shifted to other topics. And then, uh, like you yourself now, describe the specificity of Russian imperialism by referring to its context, by, by referring to other imperialist states. But it's not about other imperialist states. There is something uh, internal to Russian imperialism that needs to be discussed and that needs to be uh, sort of uh, investigated, right? For instance, the story of um, uh, imperial ambitions themselves, this Russian imperial nationalism, this needs to be reconstructed. It's not about the context. It's not about the West. It's not about NATO. It's not about the way the world will see this. It's about, it's a very Russian story, you know, about uh, these crazy ideas that Ukraine is also Russia, that uh, uh, Ukrainians are basically Russians that forgot that they're Russians, and now we need to remind them by killing them somehow. So, so this needs to be analyzed on its own terms. That's what I'm saying. And without analyzing this, we cannot uh, begin like appreciating the global picture because it's part of the global picture, right? Well, and so hence, was, yeah. And, and, and hence we said that part of the particular importance of Ukraine to the constellation of Russian yeah. imperialism yeah. is that it's the birthplace of the Rus and so of ideas of Novorussia. But I, I disagree with you that we, while I think that it's a, it's a part of the picture, we don't have a full picture of Russian imperialism unless we talk about its local history, its domestic underpinnings. I also think that uh, a sense of Russia's insertion within a world system dominated by a declining American power and a rising Chinese power is an important global context through which to understand Putin's move in invading Ukraine after American consistent expectations of aggression, Russian aggression against Ukraine, matched with America ramping up hostilities. You know, one of the striking things is that is that the Ameri the State Department was consistently predicting this, and while predicting it, was also pushing for an increasingly confrontational course from Ukraine. And some analysts were saying, you know, I mean, Vladimir has said said similar things. Stephen Cohen has said Zelensky, in trying to uh, push towards a less confrontational course, required Western, especially American, support for that less confrontational course with Russia, and that support doesn't seem to have been forthcoming. So I I want to turn to uh, to, to Vladimir to ask what you make of. Well, Ilya and my disagreement about uh, thinking about Russian imperialism um, in, in, a, in a context, whether that is uh, to, to sort of deride the, the, the specific agency of Russia, um, and also then how you've thought about this war, because it's been a striking few, three years, because in 2019, Zelensky's election was a kind of rowing back of some of the hardline nationalism. You, I think, were quite supportive of him initially. Um, and, and, and we've then seen, you know, the, the Normandy summit, uh, possibility of special status for the Donbass um, rode back on from Zelensky and the sanctioning and then imprisoning house arrest of Medvedchuk, a leading pro-Russian opposition leader, the banning, as you mentioned, of the 11th political party um, called pro-Russian. And as you've said, what that means is complicated because it doesn't mean they support Russia's war necessarily. Um, um, how do you assess? Because, because, and this gets to the conversation Ilya and I have been having, there are then kind of three possibilities, three crude, simplistic possibilities, which is people, Poroshenko, the Zelensky's predecessor, and his, his kind of supporters will say, well, look, this is just proof that Zelensky was trying to be more, le less confrontational, but it doesn't work because Putin's the confrontational actor. He's, he's the imperial aggressor, so you can't do anything. Um, others have said uh, it's, you know, Zelensky was initially close to Kolomoisky, a relatively pro-Russian oligarch, um, but that, that he's been pushed by uh, NATO and by Western power into an increasingly confrontational position. Um, uh, others would say it's a domestic pressure of Ukrainian nationalism, the big protests in Kiev against the Normandy summit, and so on. So how do you assign blame? Now, that might be, again, too dangerous a way to think about it. But but in what what, what kind of matrix do you use to think about responsibility here um, and Russian imperialism in a, in a global context? Uh... Let's say uh, you, you mentioned the uh, sanctioning and then house arrest of Viktor Medvedchuk, uh, who is uh, typically perceived as the most pro-Russian major politician in Ukraine. Although that when the, the people say it, uh, they I'm not sure they fully understand uh, the biography of Medvedchuk and uh, actually the specifics of post-Soviet politics where any ideologies were very weak, where the people like, uh, I mean, now, now Poroshenko, for example, is the leader of a nationalist opposition to Zelensky. But Poroshenko started his career, uh, he entered Ukrainian politics in the end of, of the 1990s, 
is actually the, the founder of uh, the Party of Regions, uh, one of them. As, uh, the, the party which was the ruling party under Viktor Yanukovych. The president, which is also kind of like blamed as pro-Russian, uh, and uh, Poroshenko was a minister in uh, Yanukovych government. And so Porosh Poroshenko has never been a nationalist. There have been like multiple scandals about the that his family is speaking actually Russian at home, that he retained his business in Russia even after Donbass and even after Crimea. And uh, he's been seen as more like, like a cynical oligarch, like, like everyone else. That uh, was one of the biggest reasons why he lost the elections, of course. Uh, and, actually, and the people do not understand, when, when they say that Medvedchuk is pro-Russian, they also forget that, that, that part of the story. That when Medvedchuk was coming to Ukrainian politics in the 1990s, uh, he was the leader of the Social Democratic Party of Ukraine. And uh, he promoted at that moment the ideas of European social democracy of the third, third way social democracy, but also of the Ukrainian social democratic tradition. So the, he, he spent his money on, on publishing those, those books uh, uh, that uh, the party uh, actually uh, sought a, a membership in the Socialist International. So the European Social Democrats were the kind of like perceived as allies to Medvedchuk's party. And when Medvedchuk turned into this pro-Russian politics, in uh, during Yushchenko presidency period, uh, some of the journalists uh, were reminding him that, uh, come on, you forgot your own pro-European roots. So uh, a person who ended in kind of like the pro-Russian uh, corner of Ukrainian politics was starting from the completely opposite corner. And that speaks much more about the, this instrumentalization of any ideologies than uh, that should be very well understood when the people are using these uh, labels who is pro-Russian, pro who is pro-Western. But I think Medvedchuk has always been pro himself, first of all, and instrumentalized different ideologies for different purposes. And his cooperation with Putin after uh, the 2014 was also very much about business, with, particularly with Russia. Uh, not so much about some inner um, Russian ideology. So, uh, the, the, and, and that, that, that brings to the problem that uh, that part of Ukrainian ruling class that were not exactly happy to be to, to turn into kind of like uh, um, puppets or servants of the increasing dependency on the West as particularly Poroshenko was trying to sell himself that he should be allowed to rule Ukraine in the way he was seeing it he should be allowed for all the corrupt schemes because he is the person who is just indispensable in fighting Putin. And uh, that faction of the Ukrainian ruling class that uh, were kind of like not fitting or didn't want to or didn't uh, were not allowed to to uh, enter into this kind of like. Uh, Dependency puppet position in relation to the uh, to the Western um, to the Western powers. Uh, they uh, met the same problem that every uh, like most of the post-Soviet ruling class met. They were not uh, capable to present their interests as the national interests of Ukraine. So they. Uh, there was a problem. Uh, I mean, the, we, 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 we could argue now that in case the Minsk Accords would be implemented, because perhaps and probably so, the war or this invasion would be avoided. Now that the, 
many people would would make like a lot of criticism this is, at this point. That we, should say, we should tell people this is the post 2014 uh, peace process that was started largely on EU instigation um, uh, between Ukraine and Russia over the status of Donbass in the east. It started because of the Ukrainian defeat in Donbass, and uh, the EU were mediators in the in the process. So. Uh, uh, so, uh, some people would say that uh, there would be some nationalist violence in case of the implementation of the Minsk Accord, that uh, perhaps Putin even calculated on that violence in order to uh, just, just start complete chaos in Ukraine and to, to exploit it and to take all, all of the Ukraine. And uh, uh, the problem is that uh, the uh, large part of Ukrainian population and uh, a part of Ukrainian ruling class who uh, uh, did see the uh, benefits of uh, implementing the Minsk Accords, uh, they were not capable to present it as a part of the progressive development project that uh, could uh, turn Ukraine into a more pluralistic state, into more um, uh, kind of like a bridge between the West and Russia. As actually, m many people in that spectrum of Ukrainian politics were saying this. However, they uh, were not capable to develop this into a consistent programmatic uh, agenda uh, that would not only speak to the people who uh, wanted more kind of like normal relations with Russia, not not so hostile, uh, but also we could, could, would, would be interested in them as the uh, possibility for Ukraine's development. And uh, they failed about that. Maybe they didn't have to have actual time for that because Putin decided to abandon all this and just start war. And uh, and this speaks to, okay, so Medvedchuk was arrested. The problem is that, uh, indeed, uh, Medvedchuk's party was the second popular in 2019 elections. But why practically nobody uh, started protesting in support of Medvedchuk? Um, when, in 2015, the Communist Party of Ukraine was also suspended why practically nobody was defending the Communist Party, which was not a minor party, it uh, won 13% at the 2012 elections before the Euro Maidan. Nobody wanted to defend them. And uh, th this speaks a lot in, uh, in, into the, this um, unequal political capacity of the different parts of Ukraine. When the people uh, under the what's conventionally is known that Ukrainian nationalist project were more mobilized, were more um, politically active, were more capable to push for their agenda, even when they were in minority within the society, but they were capable to push for it. And that, of course, is a, is a part of the explanation why the Minsk Accords have never been implemented. And, uh, but another part, even when they were in majority, or at least in very sizable minority, they were not capable to defend their interests. They were not, not so much mobilized, they were not organized. They didn't have the even, even any kind of convincing leadership that could coordinate them. And, and that's a part of the explanation of the failure of, uh, of, of, of Ukrainian politics to move into some alternative direction instead of uh, where we get in 2022. So when, when uh, I mean, again, it's one of the popular simplistic pictures about Western Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine, as if something, uh, again, mirroring each other. But again, it, 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 it's never been mirrors of each other. There have been very fundamental differences of how that uh, Western Ukrainian politics was organized and how the Eastern Ukrainian politics was organized. The uh, Ukrainian oligarchs who could, like in the long-term interest, who could have been very much interested in 
in different agenda, in different development of Ukraine, they were never capable to organize this uh, medium layer of politics, their own civil society. And the civil society was more like dominated by the nationalist and pro-Western uh, people. Even when their own agendas didn't have uh, the majority support in Ukraine. Of course, the neoliberal pol policies have never been supported. And um, many of the like, uh, iconized and idolized reforms uh, in the uh, uh, Ukrainian civil society have been actually very unpopular within the Ukrainian society at large. But these people did have political resources to uh, push the agenda on the uh, weak Ukrainian state. Uh, Ilya actually started the, uh, his, his argument that Russia was more effective in implementing the new liberal agenda because Russia was, uh, has actually the strongest state capacity. Ukraine had weaker state capacity. And in, uh, uh, but what happened is it's not that the Ukrainian state was the driver of neoliberal reforms, but Ukrainian civil society was capable to press on Ukrainian state and to force the Ukrainian oligarchs to agree at least partially on those reforms that were actually uh, uh, dangerous to the oligarchs' interests themselves. So th 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 that's how it works. Again, this uh, complication of this very simplistic East-West dichotomy about Ukrainian politics. Thank you so much. We are uh, formally out of time. I'm going to give Ilya a quick chance if there was anything to ask if there was anything there that you wanted to respond to. We've covered so much ground. There's so much more that I wanted to cover. Uh, we never have enough time. Um, but Ilya, did you want to say anything quickly in response to, to that to, to, to finish us off? Just uh, really quickly, I think that uh, Valodi's description is very valuable, that it's not just East versus West, it's a much more organized nationalist sector, let's say, versus uh, less organized uh, uh, sort of part of society that has some kind of opinion, but cannot really express it, right? But then the thing is, probably this is because of uh, the threat of the Russian war. And in fact, uh, the ongoing conflict since uh, 2014. So because of constant Russian threat, nationalist sector of the society had uh, its power because they could point at this threat and say, look, so there could be an invasion. And then indeed there was an invasion, right? So in a sense, apparently they were right. And so this is why uh, this uh, other part of Ukraine, this other Ukraine, let's say, could not materialize as a political force because of constant threat from, from Russia. So maybe if Russia acted differently, then Ukrainian politics would have been completely different, right? It's just sort of speculation that I have. I mean, just, just one note, it's been even before 2014 like this, that mm -hmm. uh, as Ukraine was politically degrading and the dominant Ukraine, or what has become a dominant Ukraine, has been more and more in power. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think we've, we've tried to work out a picture in which, with plenty of disagreements between us, um, in which the uh, aggressive imperial maneuverings of Russia sit alongside domestic histories of Ukrainian nationalism. You know, it's weird for me, I turn on the, the BBC here in Britain and hear uh, sort of celebratory stories about Ukraine now, uh, a special report about the Khmelnytsky uprising in the 1650s as a founding moment of Ukrainian nationalism. I remember narrated to me as a Jew who had Ukrainian family who were kicked out, Khmelnytsky is remembered as a massive pogrom. Um, so the, 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 the complex entanglements of Ukrainian nationalism for what it means for its internal others, Jews and Roma, for, uh, for, 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 for changing external others, to, to put that into the picture alongside Russian aggression to which it's sometimes a response and alongside uh, Western imperial attempts to use Ukraine as a kind of plaything on, on a chessboard. Um, trying to build up that complex picture, I, I'll just say this, we've had a very good 
denunciation from both Ilya and Vladimir of the simplicity of a mirror as an image, which says, look, everything's just the same on both sides of the inter-imperialist binary. I think that simple image is developed in response to an even more dangerous one, which is a Manichaean story, a good versus evil story, in which on one side is something democratic or anti-colonial, anti-imperial, and on the other side is something aggressive. And if, if, if you're Vladimir Putin, you know what, who the good guys are. And if you're Joe Biden, you know who the good guys are, or Vladimir Zelensky. Um, and we have tried here to come up with a picture that is not uh, that Manichaeanism, uh, good versus evil. We, we've heard from both of you how almost whatever the outcome of this war, it is likely to mean very dangerous and very bad things for uh, people agitating for democracy, for freedom, for rights for minorities, for trade union rights and so on uh, in Russia and in Ukraine, uh, whoever wins. So um, it is a deeply pessimistic picture to replace the easy comforting picture of good versus evil, but also that mirror image in which these are two sides that are basically the same uh, suffocates all of the uh, complexity and detail. Um, so I've been very grateful to both of you. Um, uh, we're really out of time now, but I want to give a tiny moment if there's anything more that either of you want to say in wrapping up uh, before we say goodbye. Can I, can I hand over to either of you, uh, Vladimir, Ilya? I think you summarized it pretty well, so no. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you for the summary. And for, uh, this, for me, it was uh, one of the best discussions I've had since the start of the war. Uh, we have so much more to say, so I hope the discussion can continue. Uh, we may be getting in touch with both of you from Salvage to ask if you want to do anything in print with us or whatever, um, because it's been a really valuable debate and discussion. And you know, one of the interesting things is I didn't think we'd be having a debate today because we all agree on some of the basics. Uh, which are in widespread opinion not that agreed upon, that is opposition to all imperialisms. Um, but it's good to know that where those ba very, very crude basic things are agreed upon, you can have more substantive debates um, about how we should think about each imperialism and each nationalism um, and their aggressive interplay. So thank you so much to both of you. It's been a joy to do this event with you. I'm very honored that you agreed to, to do it. And we're very glad that Ilya has been able finally to join us safely uh, and that Vladimir is safe. And I hope that you and all your loved ones are, are safe and that hopefully one day the world looks uh, terrifying uh, in Ukraine, in Russia, and everywhere. So thank you so much, and thank you to our audience. This has been Salvage Live, brought to you by Haymarket Books and Salvage. Please subscribe. Uh, have a look at that editorial. Did somebody say imperialism? Ukraine Between Analogies, which you can find online. Uh, and we'll be back uh, with another Salvage Live. I think our next one is uh, for Red May, discussing labor and gender and mourning uh, with Amelia Horgan and Sarah Jaffe. Um, we may have an event before that, I can't remember. Um, but uh, keep, keep track of our events, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks.